So far this season, I've kind of started each episode with interviews that I did at a pop-up event earlier this year. Well, I'm going to be doing another pop-up event this Saturday, August 18th from noon to 5 p.m. at the Brink Lounge in Madison. I'm going to have a booth at the Madison Makers Summer Market and Pub Crawl. So there's going to be like 45 plus makers there. There are going to be drinks available. You can find out more about it at madisonmakersmarket.com. You can come over there and say hi to me. You could be on the show if you want. I'm going to be doing recordings just like I did last time. I'm going to be selling my book. I'm going to have some t-shirts with the logo available. I'll have stickers to give away. So stop on by. Say hi to me. You can be a maker or you can just be a person who's a fan of the show. It'd be nice to meet you. So stop on by this Saturday, August 18th from noon to five at the Brink Lounge and see me at the Madison Makers Summer Market and Pub Crawl. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray and this is American Bandito. I've been starting each show with interviews from a pop-up event that I did earlier this year. And this time around, one of the people I spoke with told me about how she got into creating a mixture of fabric and collage and embroidery art. Stacy Stone. Stacy Stone. And what do you do? Um, I take care of my children and I make some art craft kind of stuff. I do fabric collage. What's that? Um, I just find like cool fabrics that I like and I... Um, cut them out. I have some with like pinups and some with Frida Kahlo and different things and then I put them together. I use an embroidery hoop and then I put, I cut out like just different images of of um, fabric and then attach them on and then I'll add like lace and vintage buttons and then I'll do a little bit of embroidery embellishments and stuff. Yeah. So. How did you start doing that? What made you discover that method? You know, it's funny, um, the whole embroidery thing started because I, uh, because of the election. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to make protest dolls, so I made these protest dolls, and I embroidered, like, resist and things like that on their clothes, and they all have signs and stuff. Anyway, so then I started doing that, and then I um, got this stack of fabric from this woman on Swapportunities on Facebook, which is, like, okay. a neighborhood thing where people give shit, aw- oops, give stuff away. No, Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> this has actually been a very sweary season, oh, okay. so that's okay. Okay, okay. So, anyway, I know this is a long story, but this woman gave me this stack of fabric, and I was like, cool. And it had a lot of, there was a lot of imagery and stuff on it. So I was like, I'm just going to, I don't know. I just started cutting out stuff because I had been embroidering, but I kind of wanted to like amp it up a little. And then I just went from there. And then now I, yeah. And you make dolls. I do. I do make dolls. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a seamstress, but I was like, well, I'm just going to do this and have a sewing machine, you know. You Compared to me, you can call yourself that. I got nothing. Not that you can see. I'll show you a picture if you're interested, but yeah. Um, So yeah, so that's been kind of what I've been doing since I um, stopped working full time. And what what brought you down here today? Just supporting the artists or? Yeah, support the artists and a lot of my girlfriends are vending and I like to shop. This week, the person I talk with on the show is one that shares a similar artistic interest with me. I'm Gavin Fulgert and I do animation and music composition. In February, I think it was, I decided to go to an animation meetup downtown so I could meet other animators that lived here. Gavin was one of the other people that went. Afterwards, one of the things that he submitted to the Facebook group was a stop motion animation. As far as animation, the stuff I've always made has been in the two-dimensional cartoon realm, but I've always wanted to try making a stop motion movie. I asked if he'd like to be on the show so I could learn more about what he does. So, we met at the Collectivo on Monroe Street in his neighborhood to talk. I went to school for graphic design and illustration. MATC was my, was my choice. That was an associate's degree, so two years. I, I thought it, for graphic design, a lot of it's on the job anyway. So getting through the technical, like the basics, and then jumping right into internships and all that was, was the way to go. So that was, I think while I was taking those, those classes for graphic design, I ended up taking one After Effects class that wasn't part of the main program. And that's when I sort of fell in love with all things After Effects and all things animation and motion design. A lot of your work, or at least what I've seen that you've posted, is motion graphics in the sense of text that's turning from one motion to another or kind of displaying things and then maybe a character coming up. What made you find an interest in that? I don't know. It's, I've, just, I've been all about smooth animation. And storytelling, I think, is, you know, with characters and all that, that's something I'm trying to get more into. I've just always had a passion for like, just seeing smooth graphics. And I, I guess I come from a type-heavy background. Like, I really like typography and 
and just aesthetics in general and objects moving. So motion graphics sort of accommodated those different things. And I saw one of the pieces that you did. It, it was a graphic card you did where it called out like the kerning and the oh, different yeah. things of the uh, on the letters. How did you kind of fall into that background? Uh, I think specifically, I, I, once I was in going to college, there was one teacher in particular, Mike Martin, who I ended up taking his type class and just kind of, he taught me the basics of kerning and I'd known the, the basics beforehand, but it was, it was sort of a whole new world about you know how a certain type can make an audience feel a certain thing, and I thought that was really powerful. You know, it's it's a it's a separate side of I know visual communication that it's, it's super interesting to me. Yeah, one of the people that actually turned me on to the whole concept of the typography and everything. And one of the things she taught me was, cause I was just like, this is somebody else's font. Why are you messing with it? And she goes, you always use someone else's font for less work, never keep their kerning. And then when she started showing me, I was like, okay, damn it. I understand what you're saying now. It's sort of a double-edged sword where I've heard you always want to teach your worst enemy about kerning. Cause then they start noticing, they start to notice bad kerning everywhere. And that's, you know, I'd be middle of conversation sometimes and then just stop everything. and point out some sign behind someone like it's it can get pretty bad but but then you also realize you're that guy I'm the one on, on dates who like criticizes menus and all that it's, it's pretty bad there was an animation event and that's how I found you you and one other guy were the only ones that posted after the fact and like did some animation stuff and I was like oh I'm gonna reach out to one of those guys for the show to meet them so I guess I want to know what's your animation background as far as so you started doing the motion graphics thing but you've also done some crazy ass stop motion animation that I've seen on your reel well if we're going way back I used to do a lot of stop motion with with dominoes and a little bit of clay you know this is back in like middle school and that was super basic. I think I used like a webcam or something lo-fi, something easy to do. And then for a while I, I didn't really touch it. There were a couple years, maybe like a decade in there where I, I, maybe two decades even, where nothing really happened in that area when it came to stop motion at, at least. And then the, the American Girl opportunity came up and I got that because of a referral. I'd worked with motion graphics. I, I'd done motion graphics projects for a client and they knew that American Girl was looking for stop motion animators, at least not a, a freelance kind of thing. And she ended up just contacting me, being like, hey, I recommended you for this position. If you want to take it, go for it. If not, whatever. And that sort of sparked up my, my interest again. And so I, I worked, I think, two or three weeks there last year. And now I'm just sort of working on my own you know, trying to do some, just stop motion for my, my own sake. Are you fully freelance now, or are you working for somebody, or what? Yeah, I'm fully freelance right now. Are you doing well at it, I guess? I was going to say, how's that working out for you? And that sounds like an insult. I mean, who really needs clients to begin with? Like, no, I'm kidding. It's a, it, it, you know, it's any freelance, it has ups and downs, and it's, it can get slow for a week or so, and then super busy. I'm enjoying it quite a bit at the moment. It seems to be pretty steady. I mean, it's, I can survive off it, and that's really what it comes down to. What made you decide to go, I'm not going to work for these companies anymore, I'm just going to do it myself? Well, I guess it's two things. I think in the graphic design world, I think there's a lot of jumping around initially. You know, trying to find the right fit with companies and all that. But also on the personal side, I really like just to do everything. You know, I, I like the flexibility of trying, you know, stop motion for a company or like trying this out, not being pigeonholed into one thing. I, I listened to some of your previous podcasts, and I'm forgetting who said this, but someone mentioned just doing good work is, is you know, in a way, promotion where that's, that's worked for me, where I, I would do work with one client and be professional and get my a project done, and, and then that would lead to more opportunities. Uh, but I think initially, what really helped me was, uh, at least for animation, I, I went to LinkedIn and just typed in like animators Madison or like motion graphics Madison. And then every single person with that kind of history I would contact. And that was, I got, I think my main client directly from that, being open to opportunities in general. Like that's, I know you, you hear that everywhere, but you know, if something comes around, don't in initially just pass it off as this might not work for me. Just see, see how that works. 
you know, kind of consider if it would work. On your portfolio, you had a, a whole SoundCloud playlist of stuff that you did. So first of all, what's your background in music? I took piano when I was really young for like five, six years. And that was, that was more just the basics. Like they tell you to balance that quarter on your hand and make sure like you're playing it perfectly. I didn't ever do that much, yeah. I don't, I don't think my teacher actually told us to do that, but I, I heard that from a friend. So I just I ended up trying that. Beyond those six years when I was in like middle school, early high school, I ended up just playing on the piano and making my own stuff. And that's just sort of, I ended up finding this tool, FL Studio. Back then it was Fruity Loops, from animation to you know video to music. I think just playing with time is super fascinating for me. And I, th I think stop motion in particular, that's, it's, it's, your, it's sort of taking a time lapse. It's a weird thing with time, right? Because you're, you're spending sometimes five minutes on a single frame on like a 30th of a second. And that's, that's so weird to me in, in an awesome way, if that makes sense. Before I had a, a keyboard, like a, not a computer keyboard, but you know, the piano keyboard hookup for my computer, it would all be you know, clicking with the mouse, individual notes putting in. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, room for happy accidents. You know, sometimes you put a note in the wrong place and it turns out better. I think that's super, I mean, that happens in keyboard playing anyway, like it happens regardless of, of medium. But I, I noticed for me, I just, certain things happen in successful ways that I wouldn't expect. But yeah, all FL has been self-taught for me. I just diving in there. I had a friend who, during high school, learned it with me and sort of we taught each other. I do what's called swappas with one of my friends. What's that? So we, we both have our own workstations when it comes to FL Studio. And we come up with a couple of diversifiers or kind of ground rules like, oh, it's, let's only use these sort of instruments or let's work in this time signature. Okay. And then we spend like an hour working on our separate projects and then swap computers. So then we build off the other person's work for an hour. So we're sort of, and then we sometimes switch back and it's, it's less of a collaborative, you know, in the moment, like, oh, should this move here? It's more of like a building on top of the other persons. And that's cool because you get to see you know, how some, someone else works, how, how someone else organizes. So you're, you're learning not really through them teaching you, like you know, speaking to you, but learning just via how they, how they work with the tool. And that's very, that's fascinating to me. I love it. How did you come up with that? Did you hear about that somewhere? Or you guys just decided to do that one day? I don't know. I probably heard it somewhere. I can't remember. I've never heard of that before. I'd like, uh, I'd love that concept. I mean, it's, it's great as well coming up with the diversifiers. Like at some point we'd have, oh, you work on just the, the drums and the percussion. I'll just do the, the main lead and then we'll swap songs to work on the opposite. So then I'll do the, the drums and it's, uh, it's a lot to learn there. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm actually really happy that you just told me about that. That's really cool. I probably picked it up from this, but I've seen a lot of collaborator, collaborators work on, like I guess more recently, there's a, a Rick and Morty uh, adult swim video where I think every 10 seconds it's a different artist, a different animator. So you have 10 seconds in one style, 10 seconds in another style. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Any, any opportunity, like I know there's a, a music video, a few music videos that I've seen that successfully do that. And they, they share the, the transition, so it's not just an abrupt stop between the okay. 10 seconds to 10 seconds. They work in that transition. And I think that's probably what inspired it. I, I saw something like that 10 years ago and okay. wanted to bring it in. But that sort of collaboration is yeah. it's fantastic. <laughs> Have you ever thought about doing or wanted to do uh, game animation or anything like that, like CGI, 3D type stuff? It'd be cool. <laughs> but, but it's not, nothing you've actually pursued, is what I'm saying. Like once a year, I go to a, a game jam event. And they used to have it at Herzing College. And it's, it's like late January, where it's a 48-hour game jam, where you just sit down with a group of people and, and make a game. That's a lot of fun. Just because you're kind of creating this experience out of nothing like this interactive experience. I applied for some of those local game dev companies and I never ended up, you know, getting the, the jobs there, but for a while that was, that was my pursuit. 
because it was sort of in the same way that animation sort of combines all these different facets of you know aesthetics, music, and all that. Games were the same thing, just the added interactivity. I, I always love when a whole bunch of mediums come together. What's your drawing background? I'm a huge fan of just art that looks intentionally bad, almost like the Windows Paint art. That's just all pixely and. You know, they, they know from the beginning that it's, it's going to look bad intentionally. But I guess for my background, I, I, I mean, in a way I can't really draw. But it's, it's not like a, a main pursuit of mine. I, I, I do like, I have done some more flipbook type stuff, where it's draw a whole bunch of frames and see them come to life. That stuff's really cool. But it's, that was more just having a line move, and not really character-driven stuff. You can self-express without knowing anything. I've ruined many a book with the with the flip drawings. Sometimes I used to pick books because I'm like, that looks like enough pages to do the animation I want to do in it, and then I'll put it back in the library. So I'm a horrible person. Back when uh, Nightmare Before Christmas came out, I was all about like, I'm going to learn how to do that. I went and bought the clay and everything. Oh, yeah. Spent like a week trying to do it, and every time I used it, it fell apart. I had no idea what I was doing. So, so we should collaborate. Let's do something. Maybe you could show me how to work with the models that you build. I seriously had no idea how to put the damn thing together. But of course, that was before YouTube, too, so I couldn't just go, here's how you do it. He said to me that we should get together and work on something sometime. And a few weeks later, we did. I got together with him one afternoon, and we made a short stop-motion animation with Clay. It's like 10 seconds long, and it took us four hours. I know, right? And you can check out this brilliant masterpiece. It's on the American Bandito website, or you can go to my YouTube channel. Next week, I talk with someone whose drawings I found while searching for local stories on Instagram. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. Until next time, so long.